Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. Also, Dan Andriaco's Queen City Corpse, the seventh return of Sebastian McCabe and Jeff Cody. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 130, The Hounds of the Baskerville, Sick. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. (laughs) The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Actually, this is the perfect time, the perfect time to be tuning in to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And this time around, we actually get to go back to the very roots of where It's Always 1895 came from. And we're going to do it without the help of a TARDIS. Oh, well, that means I, I spent all that time washing my TARDIS. Now I've got to turn it off. Oh, well. <laughs> well, mine's in the shop right now. Well. And, you know, there there are only... So so many TARDIS repair shops in and around Michigan. Well, there are only so many TARDISes. If you ever got more than one, it's a, it's Tardi, you know. Tardi. Yeah. Mm. And I made the mistake years ago of bringing in two TARDISes for repair, and this guy gave me a brightly colored T-shirt. I said, no, no, no. It's Tardi, not tie-dye. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got me on that one. Stumped. Yeah. Stumped. Yeah. Hey, uh, well, it should be uh, it should be a reasonable time here, regardless. But you know who isn't stumped this time who? around? Who? Who? Our friends at the Wessex Press. In the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we're looking forward to October twenty-fifth and Saint Crispin's Day, when we celebrate both the Battle of Agincourt. And the charge of the Light Brigade. But you don't need to fear a massacre, because you have your copy of the Sherlock Holmes Reference Library, the original, exhaustively annotated, ten-volume edition of the Sherlock Holmes stories by Edgar Award winner Leslie S. Klinger, the most complete collection of Sherlockian scholarship and commentary ever assembled, bursting with scholarly annotations in a sturdy signature sewn soft cover binding, from wessexpress.com. These are the days when the sun pours gold into the air and flecks of light float in shafts through waving branches. On this autumn afternoon, reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the Valley of Death Road, the 600. Uh, hmm. Isn't that amazing, St. Crispin's Day, both the Battle of Agincourt and the Charge of the Light Brigade in the same day? Not in the same year, of course. Well, let's hope not. That that would require a TARDIS. That's right. Actually, many hundred TARDI. TARDI. But that, that is, I never realized that before. Yeah, neither did, uh, I don't think they did either in the ancient ancestral kingdom until, until they started looking at uh, the Domesday Book and the Almanac. Right. Well, 
before we have to uh before we <laughs> Before we have to uh, charge into the valley of death of our own <laughs> here, um, we do have a little bit of housekeeping. We would love to count you as a supporter. We have had a number of fine folks, and we won't take the time to embarrass them, uh, nor ourselves in pronouncing their names, who have decided to lend financial support to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Um, it, it, it's done via PayPal. It's done via a site called Patreon. Uh, if you want to do it as a one-time or as a recurring charge, either site can make those happen. Um, but what it does for us is it helps us meet the costs, the hard costs, of developing, uh, producing, editing, recording, and hosting this show. So any amount that you can uh, make happen, we do appreciate. And if you don't feel like supporting the blowhards uh, that we are on this show. We have another show called Trifles over at Sherlock <laughs> Holmes Podcast. We can use your support over there as well. So yes. whatever yeah, you decide. Only, we're only we're only blow lightly over there. <laughs> That's right. But, well, on, only for 15 minutes at a time over there. Yeah. But next time I think we will do a Hall of Fame because we, you know, we've been at this for 10 years and in our history we've never had um, the quality and depth of support that we have today. And um, on behalf of both of us, I think we deeply, deeply appreciate it. So thank you all. That is very true. We, we do appreciate it. So, well, let's get on with the show. Mm. A very good idea. And our guest today is one of the leading lights, uh, someone who's renowned in Sherlockian circles, but also a guiding force behind one of the great institutions of the Sherlockian world, the Chicago-based Scions, uh, the chief of which is likely the Hounds, sick of the Baskerville. And we had the opportunity to talk to uh, Don Terras, and uh, Scott will tell us just a little bit about Don, and off we go. Well, on this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, we're joined by Don Terrace, who is a member of the Baker Street Irregulars, and he is the current master of the Hounds of the Baskerville. Sick. Uh, he, he succeeded Bob Mangler, a uh, famous Sherlockian and Irregular, as the leader of this prestigious group all the way back in 2005. And Don comes to us with a significant level of experience in other Sherlockian groups, including officer positions with Chicago's Hugo's Companions Science Society, uh, where he was elected president in 1998 and 99. And as Sir Hugo, as the president there is known, he organized the Companions' 50th anniversary celebration and orchestrated Hugo's Companions' 50 years of a Sherlockian society published by Windy City Press in 1999. In 2001, Don wore the mantle of Stamford as president of the Criterion Bar Association, and in 2003 was chosen as chairman of a Doyle family dinner celebration by none other than Fred Kittle, another longtime Sherlockian, Doylean, and member of the Irregulars. Uh, and the Kittle collection, of course, uh, was established as a, a Doylean collection at Chicago's famous Newbury Library. And Don raised funds, coordinated production, and was the contributing editor for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes' essays and art on the Doctor and the Detective in conjunction with that event. He received his investiture in the Baker Street Irregulars in 2005, and it is probably one of the most fascinating investitures of the entire society, uh, and and we'll let Don explain what that is in just a moment and why it is what it is. Um, of course, Don also spent two years laying the foundation for uh, the group's oral history, which is housed at uh, Harvard University as the BSI's oral history pro project. Don's also an anthropologist by training. Uh, he took early retirement after 24 years at Northeastern Illinois University, where he received numerous awards during his tenure. 
and has also been a guest curator for two exhibitions at the John Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. And Don uh, continues his interest in museum studies and maritime heritage as the director of the Gross Point Lighthouse National Historic Landmark in Evanston, Illinois. Well, we could go on and on with additional publications and accolades, but let's get right to the man, the legend, the myth himself, Don Terrace. Welcome to the show. Well, it's very nice to be here, and I appreciate being asked, Scott. Excellent. So why don't we start out by you telling everyone what your very peculiar investiture in the Baker Street Irregulars is? Well, I, I like to kid um, <clears throat> Mike Whalen after he, he bestowed this investiture on me. Um, it is the uh, politician, the lighthouse, and the train cormorant. Uh, I like to say I got three investitures instead of one. Um, <laughs> That's good. Well, they come in a three-pack, depend, right? Depending on the way my, my uh, day goes, I could be any one of the three. Um, <laughs> I like that. So uh, mo- most of the time, I, I just simply abbreviate it to uh, the lighthouse. The lighthouse. So um, it is a, a, a unique investiture. I actually reside um, at a lighthouse. If I said in a lighthouse, people would actually think that I am wandering around the uh, spiral staircase in a tower. But uh, I happen to live in the keeper's quarters of uh, of Gross Point Lighthouse National Landmark, um, which is directly attached to the uh, uh, the tower at Gross Point. Now, how how does one come come about? Uh, being able to reside at a lighthouse? It it takes a lot of very unique training. (laughs) Um, You have to learn how to turn the lights on and off? Is that it? (laughs) (laughs) No, even they're automatic these days. (laughs) Um, I have a background in museums, as you you mentioned in the uh, introduction, uh, I was assistant curator at a small museum here in Evanston, another uh, national historic landmark. And when the position opened up here, um, technically the position is director of a unit of local government, a, uh, a park district called the Lighthouse Park District, not surprisingly. Um, I thought that uh, it would be an opportunity to have my own gig, so to speak, and to um, try and steer the place in a direction uh, that I thought it should be going. Um, the, the, I report to a publicly elected um, board of commissioners, somewhat of a, an unenviable task, um, but uh, I've been fortunate to have uh, boards that really shared the vision that I had for this site and kind of gave me a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of room to maneuver in, uh, in making it what it is today. I, I also um, wrote the uh, nomination, successful nomination, to, uh, to get Gross Point listed as a National Historic Landmark. And it, I'm very proud of the fact that it is the, was the seventh lighthouse uh, designated a National Historic Landmark, but it was the first one the, uh, of the East Coast, so uh, it makes it uh, it makes it something special in my mind. Wow! Well, congrats. So how, how, how long have you lived there? Over thirty years, exceeding my tenure with the, uh, as I said, the formal world of, uh, of the Sherlockian community here in Chicago. So now you said you're in the keepers' quarters, and so what I gather from that is that you do not have to have curved bookshelves because you've got to go up a spiral a spiral staircase to get to your library you have actually a more rational yeah i, laid out I live dwelling. in a two right i live in a two and a half story dwelling that was uh formerly the uh the head keepers um dwelling uh when gross point was first commissioned um and staffed it had a uh a dwelling for the um head keeper and also for the assistant keeper so uh, part of the um, structure is used as an interpretive area for people who come visit the lighthouse and uh, look at the exhibits and the 
the interpretive video that we have and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and the other half is, uh, you know, that's where I reside. So there's, there's no worry about them. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I I said, it's kind of an unusual situation. I I can't think of mm, probably no more than 10 or 12 in the United States like it. That's amazing. So, so there's no danger of people uh, wandering in on you having a coffee in the morning or anything. Well, there are locks on the doors. Yeah, that is a danger. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, we could be uh, we could be here for a lot longer than an hour if I was to start on my stories uh, <laughs> of my experiences here. Oh my goodness! And there, there's one thing that you should know is that lighthouses trump everything. Uh, I mean, I, I've spoken at nu- numerous conferences. And, um, you know, all of from an anthropological standpoint, from a museum standpoint, from a, uh, a Sherlockian um, angle, and it does not make any difference. Every time people find out I manage a lighthouse site or I live at a lighthouse, it just everything, all the questions go towards that. I was doing a... Uh, I was commentator for a, uh, a mystery marathon on public television here in Chicago. And during the middle of the, uh, of the interview, uh, they were playing uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's uh, home series. During the middle of the interview, they found out that I, was, I lived at a lighthouse, and it just turned the entire line of questioning off the subject of Sherlock and onto lighthouses. <laughs> So something similar is is is, uh, is happening here. It, it's all it's just amazing to yeah. me. People have a fascination with lighthouses, like they have with uh, with uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and the Sherlock Holmes accounts. I guess so. Well, you know, th- this is uh, not something that's new. I mean, one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world, of course, is the Great Lighthouse of Alexandria. Sure. So we've had this part of our uh, collective. Uh, human fascination for uh, quite some time. So I, you know, right? I'm in, I'm impressed, Scott. Well, I was a classics yeah, major. Pharaoh, the pharaohs, the pharaohs of Alexandria, as that's it's called, commissioned supposedly commissioned by Alexander the Great. That's right, and and it's also said. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. To be the the only uh, one of the ancient wonders that I <laughs> that actually had a practical application to it. Well, they call the ancient uh, Colossus of Rhodes a lighthouse, too. Uh, I say they, the lighthouse community, and historians generally say that was used for navigational purposes. Hmm. Um, so when you look at the, the ancient wonders of the world, actually two of them were um, for maritime navigation. Hmm. Well, it's um, uh, both of those are, uh, you know, known much farther and wider than the ancient foghorn of Biscayne Bay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I should say. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's get over to Sherlock Holmes then. Uh, you know, we, I, we we had to get the perfunctory lighthouse conversation out of the way, but of course, sure, wonderful connection there between your two interests uh, that Mike was able to bridge with that uh, very unique and highly appropriate investiture. Um, when did you first meet Sherlock Holmes? Oh, it was a very long period of time. It's been a very long period of time. Um, I, I take it all the way back to grammar school. We used to have a, a wonderful librarian at Washington Elementary School. I'll throw the, that plug in. I had a, a terrific uh, elementary school experience. And uh, the librarian used to sit us all down <clears throat> and read uh, stories to us. And one of them um, was The Blue Carbuncle. Uh-huh. And I became fascinated with, uh, with Sherlock at that point in time and really um, carried through, obviously, over into the, uh, into the succeeding years of my life and uh, became much more a part of it than I ever thought. It's wonderful. Do you, what, what great story. How unusual to encounter that particular story in elementary school. Yeah. Well, it's one of the it's it's one of the less controversial ones. It's a holiday story, and I believe she was reading it during the holiday period. 
<laughs> between uh, Thanksgiving Good. and uh, and Christmas. So it it's appropriate from that standpoint, and it's uh, it's docile enough so that uh, it's not going to get anybody really excited. <laughs> and and did you go on and read? It was more? a different. It was a different day and age, Scott. Yes. <laughs> Anything that would be read <laughs> these days would. Uh, the con the content would be questionable by somebody. Yeah, Bert, you were gonna you're gonna ask another question there. Uh, I was just curious if you went on to uh, read more Sherlock. Oh, uh, from at that point, yeah. no. Um, I remembered the the story, uh, my interest in the story, my interest in Holmes. I never forgot that, but I don't believe I got. I mean, that was at age probably eight or nine years old. I don't remember getting back into Conan Doyle and specifically the uh, Sherlock Holmes accounts until I was later in high school. And uh, of course, at that point, uh, WGN television here in Chicago uh, had flown in Basil Rathbone to do commentary on his uh, Sherlock Holmes movies. And I caught those, and uh, the interest was reignited again in a different way. And I became uh, an, an avid reader of, uh, of Conan Doyle so, um, and the Sherlock uh, Holmes accounts. So uh, it, it really, it, the seed was planted, let's say, in fourth grade at age eight or nine. I think it was nine. And, uh, and, uh, but it it didn't begin to blossom until uh, later on in high school. And and when did you first discover that there was this strange and unique group of people out there that had this following of Sherlock Holmes? Well, that wasn't until I got out of graduate school and started uh, teaching at Northeastern Illinois University. I, I ran into... Um, Professor Eli Lebo, very famous and, sure. and uh, in his studies of, uh, of Sherlockian, of things Sherlockian, but uh, had a particular interest in, in uh, Dr. Joseph Bell, who, of course, was a model for Sherlock Holmes, right. and Eli wrote a book on that. And uh, Eli was the one that really brought me into the, uh, the formal world of, uh, of Sherlock Holmes and all of the, uh, the different... Um, ways that you could a person could participate in uh in being a Sherlockian in the Chicago area. Mm. And there were lots of ways. <laughs> um I think Sher I, I think Sh Chicago throughout um the history of the Sherlockian movement has had more groups come and go than probably any other city in uh, in the country, which means probably any other city in the world. Yeah, I mean, at one point in time, there were seventeen um, Sherlockian groups. I'm not sure they were all bona fide scions of the Baker Street Irregulars, but uh, uh, at one time there were seventeen groups That's in uh, practicing in the Chicago area. So did did Eli kind of display before you this? Uh this group of wares and say, take your pick. Did he kind of steer you? No, towards... he had, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, he, he had his, uh, his favorite and his favorite was, uh, Hugo's companions. So ah. I started out, uh, going to Hugo's companions dinners. I think it was maybe 1984. And, um, I had lots to do at that point in time. In my regular life, uh, I wasn't a regular member at meetings, uh, or, but I did participate. You know, I, they had meetings back then. I think nine or ten times out of the out of during the course of a year, and um, I was probably present at a couple um, of them during that period. After a couple of years, I got things uh, rolling at uh, uh, Northeastern. Um, as here at the lighthouse as well, I felt more comfortable in in balancing my time, and I got more uh, more involved with uh, the Sherlockian community. Well, that's encouraging, and I know uh, Hugo's Companions is probably one of the more 
uh, vaunted groups of Chicago that uh, still exists today. Uh, what are some of the other ones? Some of the some of the bigger names that uh, get decent attendees or that have a history. Well, the Criterion or... the Criterion Bar Association it's it's dwindled quite a bit um, in I would say over the last fifteen years. Let's see. I wrote the book on Hugo's Companions in 1999, or I didn't write it. I put it together and acted as contributor. Although the, the amount of work I put into it, it was like um, <laughs> a, a personal written work. I can tell you that. Um, so the, there's been a, a lot of attrition uh, since then. The groups that are still around today, the Scotland Yarders, the Criterion Bar Association, the South Downers, Hugo's Companions, of course, the Hounds of the Baskerville, the Tourists, um, those are the ones that pot, come readily to mind. So, I mean, uh, there's still many sh- groups in Chicago um, for one to fulfill uh, their interest in uh, in Sherlock Holmes and the canon, if uh, if they so desire. And and how do they distinguish themselves from each other? Well, Hugo's Companions is uh, one of the few stag um, organizations that's still out there. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I was president of Hugo's Companions. I came up through the ranks. Uh, a few ghost companions. I not only was president for two years, but I was vice president for two or three years. I was, uh, um, I think the only position in the board that I did not hold was secretary. They have their most bold companion, otherwise known as a sergeant at arms. Um, that's where I started out and I worked my way up the ladder to, uh, to Sir Hugo status uh, for a couple of years. That that's a, a a very unique group of people. <clears throat> if you look throughout history here in Chicago and maybe even in the uh, in the nation, uh, they had some personalities associated with that group that were very very um, very unusual people, very interesting people. They all were were members of the Hounds of the Baskerville. What's interesting about um, Chicago is Sherlockian community is is that with regard to the Hounds, which was the uh, the first Sherlockian group uh, formed in 1943 by Vincent Sterrett, is that um, Matt Fairley was a member and uh, he he didn't think the Hounds met enough and he talked to Vincent Sterrett and asked him if uh, Vincent w- would approve of uh, him starting another group in, in 1949 called Hugo's Companions. Mm. And, of course, that came to be. Um, Vincent gave his blessing, and the Hugo's, Hugo's Companions met more often. And really, because they met more often, uh, they have more documented history than the hounds do. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of crossover, but um, what I'm trying to get at in a long version here is that the uh, the companions were like a scion society of the uh, um, of the hounds for many, many, many years. Um, it started out where the companions drew their membership from the hounds. But after the uh, the companions really got a foothold in the community, um, and with their additional programming uh, during the course of the year, um, they were a feeder group, um, actively um, bringing new membership to the uh, to the hounds of the Baskerville. It's a very interesting history, um, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. And we're going to take a quick break here to share some news from one of our sponsors. Of course, you've heard about Dan Andriaco's Sebastian McCabe and Jeff Cody series before, right here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, they're back now in their seventh full-length adventure called Queen City Corpse. Now, the Queen City, of course, is Cincinnati. Cincinnati is the site of the annual Queen Con Mystery Convention, which is named after the Golden Age Great Ellery Queen. So what better place 
to find our heroes, McCabe and Cody, along with a whole cast of colorful characters. And as you would imagine, inevitably, murder makes its way to Queen Con and one of the least likely victims in mystery fiction. Well, McCabe has his usual freewheeling style of mystery solving, and he runs into a roadblock in the form of a hard-boiled homicide captain who, well, just happens to have been his enemy since the seventh grade. So, who better to call on to the job than Jeff Cody and his wife, Linda Teal, who end up doing Max detective Lake work on his behalf. Now, they had only gotten on board for a fun weekend away from their small-town home. Uh, little did they know they were in for a day that was harder than any day in the office. Well, Queen City Corpse is packed with Easter eggs, both for Sherlockians and devotees of mystery fiction in general. And you'll see it shine with humor and bright writing and memorable characterization. And also the solid storytelling that's caused best-selling novelist Bonnie McBird to call Dan Andriaco a mastery of mystery plotting. Check out Dan Andriaco's Queen City Corpse at mxpublishing.com or any of the major online bookstores. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you is because the Hounds of the Baskerville sick mm-hmm. as 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 it's spelled sick um mm-hmm. just celebrated its 75th anniversary with a big dinner uh in chicago so just a week ago yeah yeah and you had uh, you had our good friend ray betzner who has been on the show here talking about uh vincent starrett i think in episode 61 if I'm not mistaken, 61 or 62 with uh, Susan Rice. And obviously, Starrett was a big part of the conversation at your dinner. He was, and he usually is a big part of the conversation at any gathering of Sherlockians in Chicago. Um, Ray likes to refer to him as one of the holy three um, in uh, the Sherlockian community, actually um, pointing out that... uh, that Starrett uh, may be the first one that was the catalyst for the movement um, with Christopher Morley um, forming the the second part of the trio and Edgar Smith uh, being the third part of uh, Ray's Holy Three. I'm sure we um, individually might think different than that, but uh, I think that's a pretty good uh, choice of people. That is, yeah, as opposed to maybe some unholy three. <laughs> well, they may be just as colorful. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. So for, so for those folks who don't know the history uh, or what's been going on uh, over the 75 years, have there been big ups and downs for the Hounds? When when you had the anniversary meeting, were th- was there some reminiscence about major milestones in the past? Well, the unfortunate thing about it is that um, many of the hounds uh, of the past were were not around um, for the 75th. Uh, there's been a lot of attrition in the hounds lately, in the membership of the hounds, uh, through death or relocation, mostly by uh, by death, and a lot of the um, uh, the people who were instrumental in in making Chicago what is commonly known as the the golden age of of Sherlock and Sherlockian studies here um, they're gone now uh, one of the very very difficult things i have to do is stand on the terrace for um, people that were very close friends uh over the years and a lot of them were from the uh, the older generation, and uh, I just hate to see that uh, that quality of Sherlockian, that quality of character, um, go by the wayside. And uh, so, having said that, um, I don't want to dwell too much on it, but that is one of the, the difficult things. And, 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 uh, you know, there's, there are replacements are there. Uh, but, um, 
it's, it's, a, it's a matter of adjusting to a change that's taking place that we're all having to get used to, getting used to as a Sherlockian. And um, uh, it, can, it can be difficult at times. I think, I think aging in general is really in bad taste. <laughs> that's a that's a very good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I'm, I mean, there, I'm, have, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah, we all have better things to. I mean, my attitude is yeah. if I have a choice between aging or reading, I'm going to read any any time. You know, I'm just going to pick up a book. Maybe Sherlock Holmes. It's um, it's just in bed. Actually, it's quite a good way to suspend time. And if yes. you can find something that takes your interest. Uh, to the point where it suspends time, I think you do stay younger longer. Hmm. Over, you know, some scions uh, for, uh, you know, example, the Sons of the Copper Beaches and the Speckled Band of Boston have published volumes over the years. I know there was, because I saw it on Facebook over the weekend and other, other mentions, I know there was sort of a 75th anniversary volume. But have have the Hounds published books in the past have there been collections of essays or or toasts nothing no there haven't been bob was master of the hounds i'm speaking of bob mangler who was handpicked by vincent sterrett to be master of the hounds um in 1964 he was master of the hounds for 40 years wow wow um i don't imagine anybody's going to even come close to to that in the future um, it was a different day and age. It was a renewal of, uh, of uh, in a big way, a renewal of Sherlockian interest, enthusiasm, activity. And Bob rode the crest of that for a very, very long period of time uh, until his, uh, not to bring up age again, but uh, his health and his age caught up with him. Mm. Um, so at any rate, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, but for all of everything that Bob did in managing and programming for the hounds and, and, and keeping the hounds in the forefront, um, there were no publications uh, that, that came out about the hounds. Uh, Bob very uh, adroitly handled the, uh, the um, Vincent Sterrett Memorial Headstone Project uh, which was a, a project known nationally to put a proper gravestone befitting um, someone like uh, like Vincent Sterrett um, at his resting place in Graceland Cemetery here in Chicago. And that took a lot of organizing, uh, fundraising, which is never fun to do. I can tell you that because I'm in the middle of writing a, a fundraising letter uh, right now for... Uh, our programs here at the lighthouse, but, um, all of that aside, uh, the, the publication that first came out, um, was by, uh, John Naminsky. So out of the 75 year history of the hounds, there's only been one publication and that was by John Naminsky, very famous, uh, Sherlockian, uh, nationally known uh, um, for his wit and his interest, not only in Sherlock Holmes, but uh, other areas of, uh, of literature as well. At any rate, he wrote a, an uh, aptly put uh, irregular 40-year history of the Hounds of the Baskerville in uh, 1983, <clears throat> um, discussing the... Uh, the beginnings of of the the uh, the group, uh, the meeting that took place in in 1943 on January 8th, 1943, that actually started the uh, the hounds. That was the inaugural meeting of the group, all the way to 1983. <clears throat> but he he wanted to do a 50 year history, but he, he, John's health was not good, and he did not think he would uh, survive to be able to do a 50 year history. So he he a 40-year history instead. And with the 75th anniversary, um, I brought us back to a, a, a round number, if nothing else, and an anniversary uh, with 35 additional years tacked on to, uh, uh, to the 40 that he did uh, for mm. 75. But those are the only two publications that I'm aware of. So what's, what's in the 75-year annual? What's... Uh... Well, I didn't want to... Uh, John Naminsky is... Uh, 
very, very uh, likable guy. His place in, in Sherlockian Chicago is so great that I just did not want to, uh, to trample on anything that he had done. So my idea was, uh, and there were so few of his uh, pamphlets, they were actually pamphlets, it wasn't a, a book, it was uh, something like I would use for one of my uh, anthropology classes, you know, a series of readings. It was put together, it was photocopied. Um, when Bob died, uh, his wife, Jerry, uh, very kindly gave me access to uh, his, uh, his library. And uh, while I was going around looking from shelf to shelf at uh, different areas of his literary interests and the Sherlockian stuff that he had, I found this... Uh, Manila folder um, and pulled it out, and there was the original version that all the photocopied versions of uh, of Naminsky's history um, came from. So I looked at that and I saw it as a work in progress um, rather than something in and of itself. And I think I, uh, no pun intended, I think I read it correctly. Um, so my idea in, in doing the 75th anniversary publication was to use what John had already written. There were, there were only a, a 100 copies photocopied um, for the uh, membership of the Hounds, and I, I saw this as something that, that ought to be done uh, in a different way and um, given the opportunity to, uh, to bring it up to a, a 75th anniversary. Um, so that was my idea. And in, 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 in that way, I included John's 40 year history in with the 75th anniversary edition of the history of the hounds of the Baskerville sick. Mm. Now, what are the milestones of that history? Um, you know, are there big things that stand out? Um, well, certainly, uh, again, one of the milestones, well, which is the, the, the book that I put together that includes Naminsky or the, the 35 years that I'm, I documented or the whole package. Well, uh, the yes. book you've just... Book it, you've just it would yes, be difficult, yes, yeah, it would be difficult to do the whole package because uh, um, we'd be here a lot longer than uh, an hour. But uh, the last but, 35? Well, the last 35, certainly, uh, that was in 1986 when, when Bob uh, put together the uh, Vincent Sterrett Headstone Memorial Committee. Um, that was a milestone. Um, the group's 25th and 50th anniversaries were milestones, of course. Uh, the Fred Kittle um, dinner with Doyle, even though that wasn't uh, wholly a uh, um, a hounds event. Uh, the hounds played a role in 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 that uh, very large supporting role, particularly with me as chairman of the uh, of the uh, committee. Um, so those are those are certain milestones reaching seventy five. Um, Bob's fortieth anniversary as as master of the hounds. Um, the hounds had a, a brief three year hiatus, um, from 1957 to 1960. What precipitated um, that? Um, oh, just, uh, according to Naminsky's hi history, it was just, uh, uh, death and relocation of members. Um, those most pivotal to keeping the group going. If you, I mean, I'm an anthropologist and I, I do look at things from a, an evolutionary perspective and an, also an historical perspective. And if you look at the, the history of most special interest groups or, or what we call common interest groups in, uh, in anthropology, you see that they really hang together by a handful of individuals you'll find the same names um, over and over again in maintaining the history, the composition, the integrity of the group for a long period of time. Um, and uh, when you reach a, a, a certain point in time and there are not those people around, 
the group takes a break. Um, if it's lucky enough, it, it comes back. There are other people with similar interests, and, and uh, that's what happened in 1957. Um, Bob Mangler was a member of the Hounds back in the early 50s, but he was called upon to uh, perform active service in the military, and when he came back, uh, he had found the Hounds uh, were in limbo, and actually Bob was the one that, uh, that brought back not only the Hounds, the companions were in limbo as well, and he brought back both the, the hounds and the companions um, in uh, in rather short order. Um, so that was a, a major accomplishment uh, in 1960, and and uh, the groups have been going on since then. The companions had a brief hiatus some years ago for, I think it was a three-year period, and uh, and they came back. So. Uh, and they're quite healthy today. Uh, the Saturday after uh, the Hounds dinner, um, the Companions celebrated the 75th anniversary uh, and with a dinner as well. So it was a pretty active, uh, a pretty active weekend. That's wonderful. So, want to want to touch back on, on on the point you raised as a as an anthropologist uh, looking at these kinds of organizations. How fragile they are how delicate in that exactly and the number of times they they rely on sometimes a single person uh a, almost a cult of personality or a just a force of nature that allows them to continue um how how are you ensuring that this doesn't happen to the hounds of the baskerville sick again there, the circumstances are such, I find, in my studies and uh, certainly in my, uh, in my own experience uh, with not only the, uh, the Sherlockian community, but I also am a, uh, uh, a part of the maritime heritage community here in the United States. I, was, I served six years as, as president of the American Lighthouse Council. Um, and... Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to say you're absolutely right. It, 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 these groups can, are very fragile, and with the um, lack of right people in the right places at the right time, they can, uh, you know, the, the tents will go down and the show will uh, will go elsewhere or just disappear for a while. As I said. What I'm doing to ensure that it's not you're not I'm not always uh, um, sure in this world today of anything. I mean, uh, is Mike ensuring that the Baker Street Irregulars is going to continue? I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, the Baker Street Irregulars is a large, very very large organization with uh, uh, a, a broad um, presence in all of the states uh, made possible by its various science. When you get down to the base of the pyramid, though, um, there can be dissolution due to a lot of, of different changes that are taking place. Certainly the, uh, uh, the Internet is the biggest one, and the way that people interact um, electronically now, as we're doing, um, it, it has made a, a big difference. Um, also, you know, there, there's uh, differences that take place, uh, generational changes, changes, and and the uh, uh, the interests of of people in a in a particular way. They might look at homes differently than another generation. It's it, it's very um, first word that comes to mind is progressive, but I mean progressive in a developmental way. Sure. Uh, when you think you've got a hold of, uh, well, it's going to go in this direction, you get thrown a curveball, and it ends up going in in a completely different uh, direction. It's fluid. 
for for lack of a better way to put it. Um, mm. I know the the term fluid means a lot of things in this day and age, but what I'm referring especially to, to a maritime it, guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 just a matter that things are in a state of of uh, flux, and they have been for some time. And I I I don't want to say that's going to be the new normal, but. Uh, uh, I think we can always uh, the state of of these of change is taking place uh, much more rapidly than it has in the past. So, do you think the hounds and the companions are at a point now where uh, these groups are able to attract a uh, a younger, uh, perhaps uh, a more online crowd? Yeah, I think you're right. Perhaps a more online crowd, but. I can tell you from personal experience, um, my personal experience in being president of uh, three organizations here in Chicago, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it gets um, very, very difficult, more and more difficult to find a good place to have a meeting, uh, a place to have a good time. Uh, there's chemistry involved in mm-hmm. in the group, of course. Uh, when I used to walk into the classroom, um, I got uh, first thing I I looked for was uh, what kind of chemistry was there in front of me in the form of uh, of students, and um, I did the same thing and constantly do with the uh, with Sherlockian groups. Unless you have the right chemistry. Um, I don't think the, uh, the group, it might succeed, but, uh, how well it it succeeds really depends on how well the members, um, interact with each other. And I think interacting with, with groups online or electronically is far different than, uh, than when you actually meet somebody look them in the eye and uh, are able to interact face to face. I'm a very big proponent of, um, of these meetings. And uh, uh, when I go to a maritime heritage conference, uh, it's exactly the same thing that's, you know, happening there. People just generally speaking, whether you're a Sherlockian or you're into the maritime heritage community or any, any kind of special community, I, th- I think you'll find the same kind of changes taking place and more difficulty in um, maintaining a base of membership than it used to be. Yeah. So how can people find the Hounds of the Baskerville sick? Well, we, have, uh, we do have a Facebook uh, presence. We also have a terrific uh, website uh, that was redone just over the last six months. Uh, Monica Schmidt, uh, I was fortunate in be, being able to enlist her aid to uh, uh, reconfigure the the website. Really did a complete makeover of the of the website. Uh, part of the website that's that's new. Uh, we have biographies of the uh, the hounds. I think we're up to seventy five percent of all those who have ever been hounds uh, are. Uh, are represented in the uh, biographical section. I owe Julie McCurris, uh a vote of thanks uh, for that um, because she she really I gave it to her. It was her project, um, and she has just done a fantastic job with it. So the two ladies in context with each other uh julie and uh and monica really uh did a terrific job in giving us this this web presence i have to also mention al shaw who is the the current sir hugo uh has been terrific in uh in getting the the hounds uh um, more accessible uh electronically than than we had in the past but I guess I also have to pat myself on the back because I was the one that first got them a, a, a website, and uh, that was 13 years ago, I think, something like that. That's pretty forward-thinking so, for a Sherlockian. It, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> I guess I guess you're right. 
So that's great. I guess another uh, another milestone that I should point out is uh, um, there aren't too many stag Sherlock Holmes groups any longer. Um, the Hounds of the Baskerville uh, were stag for a very very long period of time. Um, in a similar way to the Baker Street Irregulars. And that went by the wayside when um, a very prominent uh, Sherlockian, female Sherlockian here in Chicago, Karen Skubish, <clears throat> died. She was instrumental in helping Bob Mangler with the uh, Vincent Sterrett Headstone Project. Uh, in fact, uh, Bob said that it probably never would have been completed if it hadn't been for Karen Skubish. Wow. Uh, with the unfortunate or untimely death of Karen, uh, it really changed the whole playing field. I was uh, master of the hounds at the time. Um, Bob was still around attending meetings, and I, I said to him, uh, you know, look, Bob, uh, I really think that we should honor Karen by making her a, uh, a member of the hounds posthumously, of course. And Bob thought about it and he had absolutely no, um, apprehensions about doing it or, you know, she and he were just, were great friends. And he said, by all means. And I said, well, you know, this might be thought of as breaking the tradition. And I talked to him a little bit more about breaking the tradition. I thought of the hounds more as an honor group. And we only met once a year. We only do meet once a year. And women were always invited to the, uh, to the meetings. Hmm. And we had such a thing, uh, an institution, John Naminsky called it, of the yeoman's daughter, uh, where one woman taken, of course, from the hounds of the Baskerville, the hound of the Baskerville, <clears throat> and um, it was to honor a woman uh, who was made a member of the hounds for that one meeting, and her membership lasted until midnight of uh, of that day of oh the my meeting. My goodness. At any rate, so there were all of these factors at play, and I just. To, I just thought it was a good opportunity to open up the hounds. Um, Bob had his female friends that, uh, that he thought that he didn't have any problem with being members. Uh, I had uh, women Sherlockians who were terrific um, when I was, uh, in particular, when I was president of Hugo's Companions as Sir Hugo, that helped me out with uh, the Companions 50th anniversary, even though the Companions were a stag group and still are. And so between the two of us, we knocked it around for maybe, uh, I don't know, a couple hours. Um, I gradually steered Bob uh, to the point where, you know, the only thing he was really concerned about was that the quality of character, the quality of the Sherlockian, uh, be they, you know, be male or female, is, is kept intact. Uh, the hounds came under a lot of scrutiny and were um, <laughs> lambasted, is the word that comes to mind, by a lot of females uh, who took a strident approach to... Uh, um, to bashing the hounds, and uh, neither Bob nor I wanted any part of, uh, of them, no matter what their Sherlockian credentials were. Um, so that happened in 2010, the breaking of, of the barriers. There, there were a lot of people that told me, um, you can't do this, there's going to be all kinds of uh, fallout, um, you know, the, the criticism from, from people from the males, uh, men, organizations, and, and people who don't agree with it. I was just, you know, said you couldn't do this, but I did it anyhow. And, and you know what? Um, the, the arguments never showed. They never came up. Never. And uh, it was a bit of a surprise to me, um, but 
I think possibly they expected it uh, from somebody like me, they being um, people around the country that knew me and knew me as a, a little bit more of a progressive than Bob was. I think what really surprised them is that Bob was still around and agreed with it. Um, so I would, going back to your, uh, your comment about milestones, that, that would have to be a pretty big milestone in the history of the group as well. Yeah. So what, what However, year was that? I, I'm rambling on here. Vincent Sterrett himself, uh, made a, uh, a woman, a member um, so there was a precedent set by that that we could always fall back on. Yeah. So, so Karen was given membership posthumously in 2010. When did when did women first become official members uh, in totality? Well, Laura Page was the other part of the uh, the trio that really, really she knew uh, Vincent Sterrett personally. She was a caretaker to him for some time uh, in his later years. Uh, she got involved with the the Headstone Project. She was pivotal in, in her contribution to making the project successful. Um, so I inducted Karen, or uh, I inducted Laura as, uh, as the, um, <laughs> I hate to put it this way, but the first living female <laughs> member of the, uh, of the Hounds. And uh, we've just gone from there. I don't know. I, I can't tell you how many females we have right now. I don't. Honestly, I don't keep track of the number of females or the number of males. Uh, if they're good Sherlockians and they're good people and they fit in with the chemistry of the and the character of the group, then uh, uh, and they've attended meetings and shown support for the the, the hounds, then they usually uh, wind up on the membership roll. That's great. So uh, it's it's an annual occurrence. So next next. Um meeting the next dinner is going to be in october of 2018 well we like right? to hold it in in the tradition of of uh of the the hound of the baskervilles uh, we like to hold it around michaelmas sometime around michaelmas uh i mean it goes from i think it's been as early as uh mid september historically to mid october maybe even the third going into the third week of october but we usually hold it uh, the last week of September or the first week of, of October. Got it. But there, there are so many Sherlockian activities going on in Chicago. Um, the fall brings back uh, what in Hugo's Companions used to be the, uh, uh, the uh, canonical year, uh, the start of the canonical year. And there's just a lot of... Uh, of difficulty scheduling a meeting without having it conflict with uh, another meeting. So, uh, well, it's an embarrassment of riches of sort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is right. Excellent. Right. Well, Don, this has been fantastic to get a, a, a taste of Chicago here and, uh, Hey, fly the W with those Cubs and their, uh, their recent victory. Um, and to that hear, that was just incredible. Last <laughs> wasn't night. it? And 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 yeah. to hear uh, obviously about the uh, the wonderful uh, and 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 diverse history of uh, of, of the hounds uh, straight from you know one of the one of those holy three himself Vincent Sterrett um, it must be wonderful to follow in those footsteps uh, footsteps uh, every year uh, and and to you know continue to make that organization. Uh, sing for uh, the members and to, and to keep it going for future generations. Well, I, I certainly hope I've done that and uh, contributed uh, that in the history of the, uh, of this publication. Hopefully it'll get uh, more recognition nationally and uh, you know, that's uh, leave a legacy be behind if you can do nothing else as we get older. Right. Indeed. Indeed. Well, it was our pleasure to shine a light on your organization. Um, the only thing I realize we did not talk about, because you, you mentioned, obviously, uh, living at the, the Keeper's uh, residence and next to the lighthouse. You mentioned being appointed by a, a council of politicians. We didn't talk about a trained cormorant. Is that something we should save for next time? Um. 
<laughs> you're using that in reference to the people I work for, <laughs> or, or, or my my part in uh, in what they ask me to do. Um, there is that aspect. Hey, either well. way, yeah, it works. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> As I said, Mike uh, Mike gave me three investitures, not not just one. <laughs> That's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Well, uh, enjoy it. Uh, continue to enjoy uh, the lake, and we will uh, look forward to maybe seeing you in New York in January. Yes, thank you again for having me on the show. Thank you, Don. Our pleasure. Well, we certainly learned an awful lot about the Chicago goings on and and the uh, the Chicago signs, thanks to Don. I had no idea that there was that density of um, Sherlockian. Uh, I'm trying to find <laughs> speaking, a word other than speaking other of than density, con- <laughs> other than congestion <laughs> of um, Sherlockian activity in Chicago, beginning back in the 1940s with. Um, Vincent Sterrett, and I did. I had no idea that Hugo's companions came because of uh, an observation that, gee, you know, the hounds uh, as a group wasn't meeting enough. Um, yeah. So all and, of that was something of an eye opener. And and how odd as well that um, that well, I guess they both were stag at the time, but that the second society, Hugo's companions, still remained stag. Uh, to this day, there are very few of those left uh, nowadays. You know, the Speckled Band announced its intention to uh, to admit women, um, as as did uh, I think the Copper Beaches. Uh, it's kind of the the modernization of the Sherlockian movement. And you know, the great the great thing is that uh, in a in a town like Chicago, uh, where even if you still do have an organization that is only open to men, that there are so many other organizations uh, that people can turn their attention to if they don't want to support that kind of thing. Uh, it's mm. nice to have options. I must admit, I, I was probably not following this as closely as I could have, but I didn't completely understand Don's um, explanation of that history. It sounded to me as if uh, what I heard, what I thought I heard, was that women were always attending hounds meetings, but they weren't um, formally inducted as members, and that right. can't possibly make any sense. I mean, maybe that's what he did say, but maybe. Well, I, so know, I was confused or inattentive. That, yeah, that, I mean, that's the thing. If if the only time you meet is for the dinner, and they revoke someone's membership after the <laughs> dinner. Okay, well, just reinstate it next year before the next dinner starts. I mean, yeah, well, you know, I always think of Bill Waterston's great comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes, and Calvin would be up in his treehouse with his paper hat and his sword, mm. um, thinking to Hobbes that he was having a great club, and because there were no, you know, stinky girls <laughs> involved, and Hobbes was just thinking about Susie Durkins and yeah. smooches. See. That's that's what makes it so special. Right? I guess so. having the women so, there. Yeah. Wow. Well, well we, enjoy we, enjoying all of this, you know, with your peers, and uh, that's it. It's been it's been a lot. It's never in my lifetime have have there ever been, you know, a consideration of um, peer relationships that didn't extend to women. I mean, but then, you know, I uh, came of age in that uh, women's. Um, independence, uh, women's liberation kind of era, the echoes of that. So. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you think about how far we've come in the last uh, few decades, and, and yet still how far we have to go. But we'll get mm. there. Mm. We will. The early days of Sherlock Holmes are synonymous with the Holy Three, Christopher Morley, Edgar Smith, and Vincent Sterrett. And it is, of course, Starrett, who is inextricably linked to the city of Chicago. In the earliest days of the Baker Street Journal, there was a profound evidence of contributions from that trinity. In fact, the very first issue of the BSJ included contributions from all three, including Vincent Starrett's Calix Meus Inibrians Quam Priclerus Est, 
that's my cup runneth over in English, looked at the man and not the legend of Sherlock Holmes. Christopher Morley contributed his now legendary clinical notes by a resident patient. And Edgar Smith kicked it all off with his first editor's gas lamp, The Game's Afoot. We're also treated to a piece by fellow Chicagoan J. Finley Christ, whose chronology and four-letter abbreviations are still used today. Christ went about an identification with James Boswell and the island of Ufa. There's so much to be gotten from these early issues, available at your fingertips in the EBSJ, a single-disc volume that contains the totality of the Baker Street Journal's archives from 1946 to 2011. Have access to these legendary essays and analyses and much more by visiting BakerStreetJournal.com today. Well, this, uh, we certainly do commend your attention to that that hallowed institution, which I think from its, uh, I wonder what what was the date of the, the first appearance of publication in the Baker Street Journal by a uh, female author. Speaking about our last well, conversation, well, I, I think that, that was that very was. early on. You had uh, Helen Uasova. Uh, sure. Was, so wasn't that in like like I think like it was old the first series episode. volume one number one? I think it was the very first uh, vol- uh, number. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and as we recently discussed, well, not recently, but as we discussed in uh, an episode of I Hear of Sherlock, we have plumbed the depths of the Helen Uashova mystery to find out that there really was a Helen mm-hmm. Uashova. And uh, I don't remember the number of that episode, but uh, how interesting. How yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, we've had a robust episode. We've had a great discussion with Don. We've had visits from the Baker Street Journal and the West Express. Happily, we have just one one sponsor left. Oh, who is it? Friends, you don't have time to press buttons when you need an Uber or a sausage pizza. Hey, Siri, get me Beaton's Christmas Annual. The only option I see is the annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony on Independent Drive in Jacksonville. But how can you have new technology and the Sherlockian experience? That's why you need Mrs. Hudson, the new intelligent personal assistant from Sherlock Holmes Brand Products. Her growing library of commands beats Alexa every time. Ask her for anything. Mrs. Hudson, we're out of straws. Oh, Mr. Holmes, this is the last straw. Mrs. Hudson, happy Halloween. Oh, frightening the witch out of honest people. It's the only voice command assistant that delivers the three C's. Chipper, charwoman, chatter. Chatter. Act now to get the free upgrade to Mrs. Hudson 2.0. Mrs. Hudson, tea please. Not your housekeeper. Available at your local Sherlock Holmes brand retailer today. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Now, I suppose we're going to find out that Mrs. Hudson's real first name is Alexa. (laughs) We always thought it was Martha. Oh, I think only Vincent Starrett thought it was Martha. <laughs> well, how appropriate uh, that we're talking about that here on this Chicago-based episode. Yes, absolutely. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well done. Thank you. Well, folks, if you like the kind of entertainment you've just heard, the, the, the last hour of which you've been wasting away either in your armchair, on your daily walk, on a commute, maybe falling asleep in bed, if you like what you've heard, let us know. Leave us a comment on the show notes. You can find them at ihose.co slash ihose130, uh, which is on the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere website. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, all as I Hear of Sherlock. You can send us an email at comment at ihearofsherlock.com. And I believe the phone lines are still open. Yes, and you can go to Facebook.com slash I Hear of Sherlock, I Hear of Sherlock dot Tumblr dot com, Twitter dot com. No, no, no more Tumblr. Oh, we're untumbled? We've, we've tumbled away from Tumblr. Hasn't oh, been updated you know, in quite some time. So is everybody else. Yeah. We, we have the but, social uh, networks covered. It's, it's the non-electronic ways that you have to help people understand, Bert. 
Oh, right. Yeah, it's so dial. Yeah, so dial us. Send us a note. Send us a letter. Yes. Actually, a lovely thing to do is just get a small post-it note and write two or three sentences in the back of it in very tiny type and paste it to a ten or twenty dollar bill and mail it <laughs> to us. And I hear of Sherlock uh, everywhere. Uh, Grand Central Station, New York City, New York, and we'll get it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait to see all the mailboxes in in Grand Central stuffed <laughs> stuffed with twenty dollar bills. Everyone yeah. will be happy. Again. Wow. Well, thanks again for wasting this hour with us and allowing us to waste an hour of your time. Uh we look forward to chatting with you next time with another very special guest who has written a very special book. Who is it? Well, we don't know. We don't. We don't plan. Actually, that far. we do know, but we're not telling. Well, that's true. We do know this time. We could tell you, but, but then that would be cheating. To, well, that would be cheating, and and of course, then we'd have to kill you. Yeah. Well, until the next time, I will remain on my toes as Scott Monty, and I am flat-footed Bert Wolder. <laughs> <laughs> the, the game's a foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck. And believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.